So my definition of biohacking is very broad. Biohacking to me is doing sound science in unconventional places like my kitchen or someone's back shed or a community lab. And what, is, what do you mean by sound science? So actual science that's reproducible, um, that is original research, that is contributing new information. And how did biohacking start? Overall, biohacking is very new. Most people have not heard of it um, or not in the context that I do it. It started about 10 years ago. There is a space in New York called GenSpace, another space that kind of at the same time came about called BioCurious in California. So it's pretty new. So if it's only started 10 years ago, why, why, so, why is it so new? What's, what's the significance of now versus 20 years ago? Right, um, because the barrier of, uh, to entry right now is very low. So the equipment costs have come down, there are places to get used equipment, and just overall new equipment costs have gone way down from what they used to be. And so now it's totally possible to get onto eBay or go to university, university auctions and get inexpensive um, equipment. Now you mentioned since you're talking about equipment and home labs, I think we have an image, if they can pop up, of the, uh, uh, the thing you put your hands in. What do you call that thing? Yes, yeah, so I call it a portable semi-sterile hood. Um, the two people who came up with it and shared it with me call it a dead air box. And um, they're with Binomica. The idea is that you need to have sterile conditions a lot of times in a molecular lab. And this allows pretty sterile conditions. And the laminar flow hood is what you might use otherwise, what's standard, but those are thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, this is a sterilite container that I picked up at Meyer, cut out some holes for the arms, and then you can just spray with bleach inside and you have a sterile environment to work in. And I want to jump back to something I meant to ask earlier is when you talk about biohacking, how did you become a, a biohacker? I know this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I had a very kind of nice research position and I didn't fit into corporate, shocker. Um, so I was fired from my position and um, I missed research. I felt compelled to do research. I feel like I'm pretty good at it and so I just decided to create my own lab at home. When you, we talked earlier that you had trouble fitting into the science industry, and, and what, what are the issues that you see that other people like you have, or biohackers have? So, some of my ideas are not kind of normal ideas, and um, <laughs> um, that's just how it is, plainly. So, um, and, and all of us are kind of in the same boat. So, um, biohackers, I kept having ideas, having ideas, being told, no, 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 that's not been done before, you can't do that, that's not possible. So banging my head up against the wall, and so I, uh, that, was, that was the problem. <laughs> and we talked earlier, you mentioned it's similar to entrepreneurs who 20 years ago, it was a new thing, what's an entrepreneur? Somebody that doesn't fit into the corporate environment. So you're saying it's very similar in the science community, you're just entrepreneurs that don't fit into the typical science. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Now we talked about the equipment of the, I forgot the name of it, the thing you put your hands in. Yeah, the dead air box. The dead air box. Now, when we talked earlier about that biohacking is so new, how about some of the other equipment? If they can put up the, uh, the image of the, if you can explain what this, the boo ion or minion, whatever it's called, if you can talk about that. Um, so, yeah, the min ion. I brought one with me. Um, this is a min ion. It is for sequencing genomes. And so um, this plugs in, it's got a USB port, you can plug it into your computer. And um, it was actually used this morning in BioBlaze Community Biolab, which is my biohacking space, um, to sequence some, um, some parts of an organism. Now, I'm fascinated because it's a USB. I mean, w when you look at the USB, that to me, that just, it's so <laughs> commercial for, you know, residential or, or for consumers. How much, what, explain a little bit more detail what this does specifically, so this is fascinating. Uh, how it works? Yeah. Okay, so it's using nanopores, and um, basically the environment within a, a little vesicle in here 
is different pH than the environment outside. And so you can actually thread strands of DNA through these little pores and um, the, the change in pH is going to actually be giving kind of a sound a little bit and that's what's recorded by the computer. And it's super fast and um, you know, it, we, we did it this morning, like I said, at the lab. So. Through a USB port on your laptop. Exactly. And five, 10 years ago, how could you have done this 10 years ago? Um, well, let's say that, so the Human Genome Project is something that probably all of you know about. That finished in 2003. It took 13 years to complete the first sequenced human genome, and it was $2.7 billion. This unit costs $1,000, and you can do this in a day, basically. So. <laughs> I know people are probably asking, and let's jump into the different subgroups of biohacking, and I know we want you to talk about your dress. So the dress that I'm wearing right now is considered a biotextile, so that's one facet of biohacking. This dress was made by Sasha Lauren of Kombucha Couture, and she designed it especially for this uh, event for me, so that was super awesome of her. But it's made from a kombucha, sco kombucha scoby. And um, I don't know if we have a picture, if you guys know what that looks like, but it looks like just a big slimy layer. I brought some with me um, that you can see after you know, all the talks are finished. And she takes, yeah, so this, uh, this, this thing in the middle, that's a kombucha scoby. It's a cellulose layer that's actually spun by yeast. And it's um, completely organic, biodegradable. And this dress is actually, most of it is edible. So. And, and it comes from a, a fashion? Fashion farm, yes. Sasha has a fashion farm at UC Davis. And what else does it do with the picture of the, the uh, container? Um, so, kombucha is a fermented tea that, you know, you may, some of you may have um, bought at the stores and things, but something else that we have done with it is used it for biopackaging. Um, I taught a class called Biohacking at Benedictine this past summer, it was super fun, um, and we did a lot with kombucha. So, instead of a plastic bag, we decided to package up split pea soup ingredients into a kombucha SCOBY. And so it's reusable, it's actually even edible, um, and you know, you're not having plastic waste. So. <laughs> I wanna jump into something. So 10 years ago, to sequence the genome, you're looking at billions, now it's $1,000. I think a lot of people might think that's kind of scary, and, and what's, what's your thoughts on that? What are some scary things that could happen? Right, I get it um, that people might think it's a little scary that people are doing this in their homes um, or sheds. <laughs> but, um, and, and it's true, I mean, it, it's, it, you could do horrible things with this, but um, I'm here to tell you that I sleep well at night because I know hundreds of biohackers and no one is doing that. Everyone is just trying to disrupt the way science is done and um, just better the world, really. Yeah. Not, not to scare people, but I know one of your favorite questions was, what's the greatest advantage of biohacking? And your answer? Right. Biohacking is unregulated at this time, and I think that is the greatest advantage. <laughs> is, is there a lot of unregulated, meaning that there's no standards or the government standards? or? Right. No one knows what to do with us. Um, <laughs> this is such a new movement. The FBI has actually visited my community lab. Um, they're cool. They just wanted to be like, we know you're here. Um, I'm like, great, come back anytime. Um, so they, they don't really know what to do with it. So the FDA has made some statements about some things that biohackers have done or want to do. Um, they are sometimes treating um, products of biohacking as drugs, which are, they're animals, but they don't know what to do with them, so they're saying they're like drugs, and they, there's just not a framework for this. Yeah, and it's, it's just fascinating that it's, it's so new. And you wanna show your tattoo? Briefly, sure. you wanna show what that's about? <laughs> 
So one tattoo, it's a DNA molecule. So I'm pretty true. committed. Right, true. <laughs> <laughs> the, the true mark of a biohacker. Now, with our discussions, is it safe to say biohacking is like, it's like the Wild West, right? It is like the Wild West, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Now, to flip the scary side, because to me it's both terrifying yet fascinating, how about you share some of the more positive benefits of having sound science in your garage or your shed or your kitchen? Sure, there are so many stories I could tell that are positive. Uh, a, couple of my, my, sorry, a couple of my friends are HIV positive, and they are trying to cure themselves because no one else has a cure for them. So um, they have a company called Ascendance Biomedical, and um, we're collaborating with them. Other labs are collaborating, um, and they're, they're actually making um, they're, a lot of exciting things are coming out of their lab. Now, how about you talked about the Open Insulin Project. Can you tell a little bit about that? Sure, yes. The Open Insulin Project is, um, it started by BioCurious and Counterculture Labs in California, but it's also a project that is a community project. Everything we do is open source. So there, there's no secrets, there's no competition. We're all just trying to help each other. Um, and the idea is that, you know, everyone knows the cost of insulin is very high. And the statistics are that 50% of people who actually need insulin to live do not have access to it. So that means 50% of the people are dying. This is terrible. We are not standing for that. And so the Open Insulin Project is a project to try to make the cost of human insulin um, affordable for everybody. So you're saying that anybody out here could make their open dead air box, spend $1,000 on a sequencer, go in their kitchen and be part of a project to, event, to be part of a group to find an open source insulin. Absolutely, so biohacking totally levels the playing field. You don't have to have a science background, a degree, you don't have to have a degree at all. Um, it's really, for me, is providing lots of hope um, all you have to do is want to help out. Um, you, you know, everyone's welcome in my lab to do whatever kind of research that, you know, they want to do. Um, yeah. What is this big pharma? I'm, I'm assuming they're not fans of what you're doing or your group. <laughs> you know, I won't know if I would even say that because I think we're not even on the radar of big pharma, but we will be. Well, so it, <laughs> they're they're going to know. That's a good segue. <laughs> Can you pull up the, pull up the, the Epi pencil? Because I think this, is a, this, to me, is really fascinating what your, your community is doing, if you can explain this. Right. So um, kind of along the same lines as the Open Insulin Project, um, the Epi Pencil instructions are now available for download. And uh, my friend Michael with Four Thieves Vinegar Lab has just uh, created a very inexpensive um, auto-injector for epinephrine. And it's a DIY, you just download the instructions, can go buy the parts, make your own, it's only a little over $30. And this is the same EpiPen that Big Pharma was charging $700, and you can make, do it yourself at home. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the fun part about the Wild Wild West. <laughs> and okay, and with the, there's a neat thing you did about the patient zero with elementary school kids. If you can pull up the, the uh, Zombie kit, if you can explain that. Right, so um, I'm a researcher, a scientist, but I'm also an educator. I teach at universities in the area. I also teach wherever people will let me talk about science. So um, I go into elementary schools, and this is kind of an example of some kind of workshop that we do. It's called Who's the Zombie? And it's really a patient zero epidemiology workshop for elementary school kids. And so they get cups of lotion, and then they shake hands with three other kids. They track who they've shake, shook hands with, and then in the end, uh, one of those had some starch, and you can just add a little iodine and find out who was the original zombie and who have been, who are the, now the zombies who have been infected by the original zombie. So this is a kind of a things that we, I like our, you know, our lab does. And that's fascinating, because as an adult, I wouldn't have no idea how to do that. <laughs> Finding patient zero. Uh, yeah, that, that's it out of time, but I want to thank you for sharing that with, with us. And you will be walking around at the speaker corner and you will have your kombucha scoby so people can see what it's about. I brought all kinds of goodies to show everybody. Yeah. And thank you so much. Okay.
Thank you.